So I bought a drift car in Japan and it's basically the best purchase I've ever made. But it's also maybe the most financially irresponsible one as well. In this video, in addition to buying a car, we'll explore the greatest drift playground in the world and I'll be attempting my first sense of the trip. But first, why am I actually learning to drift in the first place? Well, I've been challenged by legendary drifter Daigo Sato to a tandem at his drift mansion just outside of Tokyo. The only problem, I've never drifted before. As a Formula race car driver, I've spent my whole career preventing slides in order to optimize lap time. But I've been personally curious if there's something to learn from this style-focused dark art of motor sports that could help me become a better race car driver. I started my preparations for the series a couple of weeks ago when I had my friend Reese Conklin teach me how to drift on the simulator. Throughout the coaching session, I made tons of progress, but I still feel miles away from being able to compete. So to give myself the best chance possible against Daigo, I'm flying to Japan early, buying my first drift car, and spending 12 days on track at the infamous Ebisu Drift Playground. But before we can embark on this epic drifting series, we need to buy a practice car. To help me, I brought along my biggest car nerd friends, each with their own unique skill sets. But I'll be introducing you to them a little bit later. Now comes the question, what car should I actually buy? Even though many JDM cars are being exported to countries like Australia, the UK, US, there is still an abundance of choice if you can buy domestically in Japan. I like rotary, so what about an RX-7? Oh God, yeah, way too broke for that. Okay, how about the classic Mark IV Supra? Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? Okay, okay, uh, what about a Nissan S chassis? Hmm, okay, now we're talking. They are beautifully balanced cars, which have been adored by drifters for decades. But I'm also told that they can't take a lot of beating, so they aren't recommended for first-time drifters like me. Okay, I could go for something maybe a little bit more modern, like a 350Z or G35, but to be honest, I think they kind of sound like shit. All right, so maybe nothing from Nissan for now, but what about Toyota? Supras are clearly out of the budget, but there is one true JDM car that I've never actually seen in person, but is abundantly available here in Japan, the Toyota JZX platform. These four-door luxury sedans were once adored by your average Japanese businessman up until the late 90s. It's truly a quiet, comfortable, and boring street car, but the JZXs had one secret weapon hidden under the surface, Toyota's bulletproof 1JZ engine platform. Some of the models even had a more powerful turbocharged version, and as the cars grew older and depreciated in value, the tuner community grabbed a hold of them and turned these once sleepy sedans into competitive drift missiles. Their long wheelbases made them super stable for high-speed drifts, but their Toyota underpinnings also made them super reliable and cheap to maintain. With that being said, these cars are now ranging anywhere from 25 to 45 years in age, depending on the generation, so finding one in decent condition is much easier said than done. Luckily for me, my friend Jackson actually flew here several weeks early to find me the perfect car at auction. So this is your car cam. Oh yeah. <laughs> this is exactly what I had in mind as well, actually. Yeah, so this is what you spent um, all your money on. Extra 15 horsepower right there. Just kidding. Here is my brand new drift car. This is my 1998 JZX100 Mark II, and while it's already been modified a bit, it needed a few upgrades to be approved for track use. All right, so to make it PV spec, you need to add a roll cage and what else to it? So you need a roll cage, you need at least a driver bucket and at least a driver harness. I didn't expect it to be like an actual interior for some reason. Yeah. But I, I knew the dashboard was in there, but I thought it was gonna be entirely stripped. Yeah, no, this is like a just, some dude's street car and then they put it up for auction and then Andy, you know, he spends most of his time working like finding the good auction cars and, and just getting them in and then they come into the shop at PV and they just gotta get them prepped. Yeah. But it wasn't just safety features that needed work either. This car had tons and tons of boost leaks. The steering column decided it didn't want to be a steering column anymore. Mm. The clutch was blown out completely. It had gone conical, like we took the clutch apart and all the plates were like <laughs> rounded in from the really? Yeah, it was Holy completely fucked up. And then this car is a reshell. So this car is actually like a non-turbo car. Oh really? It has all the turbo shit put into it, including like even like dash bits, blah, 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 blah. Wow. But it means that the wiring harness in the front is for a non-turbo, so it didn't have wiring for auxiliary fans. So to turn on the extra cooling fans, you have to have your AC turned on, because that's what it's wired to. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> so we got that figured out. 
think that's where the list of problems with this car happened. Oh no, and the handbrake exploded. And so we got the ha handbrake fixed. And then I think that is the actual end of the problems with this car. And that's like kind of the story with every car that comes from auction. Like there's okay. just always something that, need, that, that needs to be taken right. care of. This is going to be a dumb question, <laughs> but with the handbrake, do you need to push down the button to use it when you're... So this is, oh my gosh, this, yeah, you are not a, a street drifting no, boy. I'm not. Okay, that makes me so excited. <laughs> These things are like, everyone, you, you usually get made fun of for having one back home, right, Connor? Like, but they're actually pretty helpful because if you have them pulled out, it works just like a normal handbrake, but if you push it in, it stays locked. Oh, So you can sweet. use the handbrake. And Toyota okay. handbrakes are drum, they're inside the rotor, and they're super strong. I'll get the car started. Not bad, huh? That is not bad. Not there she is. There she is. It's a stock BBTI turbo. We've got cut and welded knuckles and extended tie rods. So this thing has quite a bit of angle. Oh, oh yeah, that's pretty serious. Oh, I see what you mean by the sparkles. Yeah, so they're okay. all around. This is a reshelled car, so this car is probably just bare, bare, everything at one point, and they just uh, went to town. I remember taking the back seats out and being like, is that glitter? Is that shavings? <laughs> it was like, that was shavings from the drill. And then I kind of brushed it off the dirt, and I was like, this is all been painted partly <laughs> black. No fucking way. Yeah, you can even see it, like, back here. Oh, yeah, it's like the whole... <laughs> the whole... Yeah. Oh, my God. Thanks to Jackson's weeks of hard work, the car I'm affectionately naming DeMarcus is finally ready. This is by far the biggest financial risk I've taken for this channel and I'll likely never make the money back. So it would mean the world to me if you guys wore my new Japanese themed drifting merch. My girlfriend B and I made these designs ourselves over the past several months and I'm super happy with how they came out in the final sample. Like this hoodie especially turned out so comfortable like there's no way I'm taking this thing off. And if you decide to make a purchase within 30 days of this video going live, I'll even pay for your shipping. I'm only doing a super limited run of these so make sure you cop yours soon. Part of the reason this car was so financially challenging is because prices shot up massively during the pandemic, along with everything else, I guess. Jackson actually bought his own JZX100 Chaser for more than three times less than I paid for my car, but he bought his car back in his first trip here in 2019. His car is looking a little rough these days, but it was pretty much mint back when he bought it. So today the track is closed, but we're going to take the time this afternoon to explore this truly one of a kind track. Really, Ebiso is 10 different tracks placed alongside this mountaintop. The owner is legendary drifter Kumakubo, who originally built this track for his passion of dirt bike riding when he was a lot younger. Later in life, he ended up discovering the world of drifting and expanded to build several more tracks ideal for this sport specifically. And he even built a full-blown racetrack here as well. Oh, and as a crazy side note, he also built a massive safari park on site as well, but that's a story for another video. There really is nowhere else in the world like this place, and naturally it has attracted the best talent because of it. Take my future competitor Daigo Sato, for example, who actually earned his stripes at this very circuit and with perhaps one of the most famous drifts of all time. <laughs> Throughout this series, we'll be building up to the sketchier tracks and adding layers of complexity like linking and tandeming as we go. But before we get to my first slides tomorrow, we gotta do some exploring around this beautiful area of Fukushima, Japan. Alright. <laughs> Got that one on video. <laughs> While we were having a great time exploring this amazing country, deep down I was feeling really nervous for my first day of drifting. But all I can really do is sleep on it and take it lap by lap in the morning. So it rained last night. Like, a lot. I think we're gonna have to take things super slowly in the beginning. To help me learn the absolute basics, my friend Connor is gonna be showing me the ropes on the skid pad. Basically a glorified parking lot with some cones where I can make mistakes without too many consequences. Connor is a super talented drifter who's actually never been on track before. He's actually only driven on Virginia's back roads, <coughs> allegedly. But you'll see just how good he is in future episodes. For now, it's time to get sideways for my first time. 
For now, I'm just gonna do these big donuts around these two cones, but hopefully with a little bit of practice, I can move up to the figure eights, which will require a lot more advanced technique to be able to do those transitions. But the beauty of Ebisu Circuit is that we have the entire skid pad to ourselves all day long. <laughs> You'll notice that the skid pad is pretty wet, which is a good thing for learning, but you may also notice these soap patches on the surface. Basically, this is caused by rubber which has been laid down on the surface from the previous day's dry running. And now that the rubber is wet, it's releasing super slippery oils up from the surface. Now, I've had plenty of experience racing in the rain and dealing with this phenomenon before, but this hard compound drift rubber makes for exceptionally icy conditions I've never experienced before. <laughs> yeah, I'm still working on the transition. I think the transition is what I not 100% sure how to do yet. Okay. Like my instinct is to use the uh, the foot brake, but I feel uh, like I'm using it too much and it's I'm getting the weight on the nose, but then I'm like locking the inside front and then getting understeer. So like if we're coming around this corner right here, drifting like this way, what I would do is like carry the slide and then when I want to transition, I would like kind of like give it a bunch of gas, kind of like throw a little bit more angle and then let out of it a little bit. Okay. And that kind of encourages the car to like kind of grip up a little bit and then throw it the other way. So this concept Connor is referring to is actually nothing new to me. It actually goes by a term called lift off oversteer, and it's basically when the momentum shifts to the front when you lift off the throttle. In grip driving, it's used to describe more of a consequence of a mistake, but in this case, it's actually a really useful technique. A few moments later. At first, when I tried it, it just generated more understeer. But then once I dialed back the initial steering input, then Connor's tip worked like a charm. This is so much easier of a technique than me trying to use the foot brake and then locking inside fronts. But you can see, as soon as I start building up the speed, my consistency goes out of the window. <laughs> now, of course, as we increase speeds in some of the more advanced tracks later in this series, I'm gonna have to do a lot of this with handbrake as well, which is something I've never really had to use, obviously, in Formula cars. For now though, on the skid pad, we wanna introduce as little variables as possible, so I'm just kind of working on my footwork here and trying to dial back my steering aggressiveness. And lo and behold, it resulted in my best figure eight yet. My car control is definitely looking on the up, but at the same time, I haven't really had enough time to ingrain this stuff in my memory, so I'm also still prone to make mistakes. <laughs> I didn't know where I was gonna go with that one. Yeah, so like you did exactly the right thing right there, because if you would've let out of it, or, um, or let the car grip up more, you probably would've just gone right over yeah. there. So like giving it gas and actually put it, it put you away from stuff, which is good. Yeah. I still have a lot to learn, but this was a great morning session. For now though, it's my friend Gresh's turn. Gresh is a true artist and he actually has a TikTok showcasing how he's made a custom carbon fiber and fiberglass wide body kit for his C4 Corvette, which you really have to see to believe. Like he's done this all entirely himself. While Jackson and Connor are sharing their white chaser for this trip, Gresh and I have gone in 50-50 on purchasing DeMarcus. We did that because Jackson and Connor are both like six foot eight and six foot 10. And uh, there was no way Gresh and I were gonna be able to fit in their seating position. So we had to buy another car. This is Gresh's first time drifting or really driving any high performance vehicle. So it's kind of safe to say I'm a bit nervous about where his skills are at, especially considering we own the car together. Not bad, huh? Not bad. One car. Definitely let me know in the comments if you agree, but I think this is a super impressive showing from Gresh here. He told me all he did before this was a couple of donuts in his pickup truck. He's already getting the transitions down. Oh, he's gonna be, you're gonna be on it in no time, dude. You're gonna be fine. Yeah, it gets a little addicting, I have to say. I already feel so much better knowing that Gresh has at least some natural ability, and we're gonna continue to keep tabs on his progress throughout this series. But before we move on to the level two track, I wanna work on my precision a little bit here on the smaller of the two skid pads here at Ebisu. Even though the tracks had an opportunity to dry quite a bit here, this smaller skid pad must have a completely different material because it is way more slippery, so I can really, really work on my fine-tuned precision here. The 
The more and more laps I do around the skid pad, the more I'm realizing that all the work is really done with the pedals. The more I let go of the wheel and let the car drive itself, the easier it actually is. I'm also finding that weight transfer makes a big difference here. So even just an upshift mid corner can really help you tuck that nose in. And now with just a few hours of practice under my belt, I have to say this is starting to look sort of okay. Ah. <laughs> is that second? Yeah, I put it in second because dude, there's like no grip. And with that, I was super ecstatic about my first day of drifting. Number one, keeping the car intact. But number two, I think I put together a pretty decent showing for my first time. This is only the beginning, guys. And in the next episode, we're taking on two much bigger, faster, and way more dangerous tracks. So make sure you have notifications turned on because things are about to get really crazy.